Hey everybody, Antoni here with a review of Wagner's Parsifal, which was shown at the Deutsche Oper Berlin. The conductor was Axel Koba. The production was by Philipp Stölzer. The assistant director was Mara Kurochka. The set design was by Konrad Moritz Reinhardt and Philipp Stölzer. The costumes were by Kati Maura. The chorus master was William Spaulding. The children's chorus master was Christian Lindhorst, and the lights were handled by Ulrich Niepel. Now, the thing about Richard Wagner's last opera, Parsifal, is that it's very complex, with complex themes of Christianity and crucif the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the wandering Jew, everything that involves religion, philosophy, good and evil. They are all jam-packed into one heck of an opera. And it is such a huge trip for any music fan, for any psychology buff, or someone who's into theology. I'm sure that this opera basically attracts anyone, no matter what creed they have, or if they're not that religious of a person. I'm sure that this opera will definitely capture you. Why, you ask? Well, simply put, like I said, this opera definitely has some very complex themes of redemption, um, Christianity, and everything else in between, but mostly dealing with a lot of the heavy stuff involving religion. In fact, this opera also boasts a cast of very interesting characters, most notably Amfortas, Kundri, the title hero Parsifal, Gornemans, Titorel, and of course the main villain Trinsor. Now what makes Amfortas and Kundri very interesting is simply this. It's their guilt that drags them throughout the entire opera. Now, Amfortas and Kundri basically had a little bit of an affair in which Amfortas was basically tempted by Kundri's beauty since Amfortas is the king of the Holy Grail. And on that day, Klingzor basically wounds him on the side and because of that wound, he knows that he has sinned and has carried this guilt all throughout the opera. Now Kundri is a very interesting case as well because she was like the wandering Jew who laughed at Christ at the cross and has been forced to wander the earth laughing to every man she meets. In fact, her master Klingzor pretty much takes control of her life and of her destiny. So her destiny is absolutely going nowhere because she's now Klingzor's slave and she has to find someone who can redeem her. That's why she helps out so many people, gets into so many disguises, but can't really seem to find the one thing that she truly desires and that is inner peace. She wants to sleep. She wants to just end it all, end all of the chaos, because she just needs more than anything else in the world just to sleep soundly. And with Amfortas, it is quite similar. He just simply wants to be at peace, but the wounds that they both have because of their meeting with each other through temptation ends up bugging them and they need some type of redemption and that is through Parsifal. Now yes he begins as someone who's not always that aware of showing compassion but when Kundri kisses him he definitely understands the pain that he's going to go through and the pain that Amfortas went through. Now Klingzor is definitely a villain who's not just some bad guy who wants to ruin the day, but more than that, 
he wanted to be a member of the Knights of the Holy Grail. However, he has done some sins and has done some black magic. Therefore, he castrated himself, but he basically was not allowed to join the Holy Knights. So he decides to form his own kingdom in which he's the ruler. He pretty much takes control of everything and he has these magic maidens or known today as flower maidens to seduce and lure a lot of young men, specifically the Knights of the Grail, into his bidding. That's what pretty much makes these characters interesting. And lest we forget about Gournemans. He's the senior member of the Knights of the Holy Grail. So he is very wise, especially when it comes to compassion. And he pretty much is kind of a mentor to Parsifal, especially when he recognizes him after many years of him being gone with Kundrin and with him being a hermit. He definitely serves a great purpose in the opera. He's pretty much the moral center of the entire opera. And Titorel, he was a hero who was also the father of Amfortas before his death of old age. And Amfortas is the present king of the Grail. And, well, Titorel may not always serve a big purpose in the opera, but he is widely regarded by Gournemans as a holy hero. So there is definitely a lot of interesting and very complex ideas and topics in terms of Parsifal. And with such very complex topics also comes such challenging singing, especially from the roles of Amfortas, Kundri, Parsifal, Gournemans, Titorel, and Klingzor. Now, as I've said in my previous videos, where I've talked a little bit about the Falcon Sopranos, Kundri is definitely one of them that I've named. Whether a dramatic soprano sings this role, or a dramatic mezzo, or to some extent, a dramatic mezzo contralto, there is no doubt that Kundri is a role that has attracted a lot of sopranos and mezzos. Sopranos being those of Deborah Pulaski, Astrid Varnai, Mata Mur, Walthold Meyer, and then mezzos being Rita Gore, Irene Dalis, Gail Gilmore. You name it, every one of those sopranos and mezzos have sung this very challenging character. Why is this role of Kundri very fascinating? It's so challenging because it's simple. Kundri is definitely such a fascinating character because she's a woman who has suffered for many centuries and has tried to help people, but has ultimately succumbed to her guilt because she laughed at Christ on the cross. And this is definitely such a role that a lot of mezzos and sopranos, well, mostly sopranos, because let's face it, she has a lot of high Bs and As to sing. And this role is so up there with Abigail, Eboli, Amneris, um, Venus, Ortrud, Zeglinda. Brunhilde, Torandot, Tosca. Almost every dramatic soprano and dramatic mezzo role that I can name is definitely no match for Kundry. And I definitely have to say that I really, really love this character because, well, the fact that a lot of Mezzos and Sopranos sing her is just very exciting. So overall, Parsifal is definitely an opera that will make you think. 
that is definitely not afraid to make you think in terms of conscience and in terms of who you are as a person. But more than anything, it's Wagner's music that will make you teary-eyed. There were moments where I was almost about to shed a few tears here and there, especially with those motifs. And for the record, I've also er owned a DVD of Wagner's Parsifal live from Bayreuth, which stars Siegfried Jerusalem, Eva Randova, Hans Zoten, Bernd Weichel, Leifrohr, and Mati Salmanen though it's still in Cebu, but go ahead and see this opera. You won't really be disappointed because there is a lot of heavy stuff and I'm sure that you'll get some new ideas and you'll get a better understanding of how humanity is. Now, I basically rambled on and on and on about the complexities of Parsifal. Now let's go on to the production. Now, the production of this opera is quite interesting. Why would I say interesting? Because the opera opens with Christ at the cross, where we see the action happening before the actual opera begins. It begins with Jesus Christ's final hours, with his side being pierced by a spear by one of the Roman soldiers, and Kundry laughing at Christ on the cross. And then we proceed a little bit later in the first act where it's still the same setting. They're like rocky mountains and surrounded by a lot of these fluorescent lights, which I kind of thought was slightly distracting. But the rocky hills I definitely thought were absolutely just gorgeous. It's as though that you just simply want to go there. Sure, they look fake, but it's just so breathtaking. And they use the peaks to such a great advantage, especially with the flashback scenes involving Amfortas, Titurel, Klingzor, Kundry, you name it, they use those flashbacks. And I thought the production was at its best when it comes to the second act, in which we enter Klingzor's domain. Now, I thought it just looked pretty creepy. I mean, it's a building in which time and civilization totally forgot. And just looking at it, it's so deprived of civilization. And Klingzor himself looks as though that he's some leader of some deranged cult and his flower maidens pretty much act like a bunch of maenads. For those of you who don't know who maenads are, they're basically these wild women in Greek mythology. They're the ones who killed Orpheus by tearing him from limb from limb. And while Orpheus's soul raises to Olympus, the Maenads basically get turned into oak trees as their punishment. So yes, I thought it just was thrilling at the second act, especially to see all of that steam and smoke coming up from that building. I thought it was just epic. And the costumes were absolutely very, very gorgeous. I thought the crusade costumes were just absolutely beautiful. The standout for me definitely has to be Kundry's black gown and Klingzor's and the Flower Maiden's outfits. I thought they were just so gorgeous and so colorful. They also very, very vivid. Though I always had that one question. Why is it that Parsifal in this production is the only one wearing a suit and tie? Well, I pretty much presume that in my first impression of that, I was thinking to myself, you know, in this production of Parsifal, he seems to be some average Joe who apparently ended up 
time traveling to the time of the Crusades and probably ended up butchering some swan and he probably doesn't know what the hell has happened until he meets Kundry and until he enters Klingzor's domain. But my friend Andrew, who also sang one of the Grail Knights in this production, told me, well, you'll understand during the course of the opera. And I pretty much did. It pretty much shows the evolution from the old way of thinking or the old times of the crusade or the crusades to the 1800s so to say or early 1900s so it was quite a mixed bag i like the costumes of gurnamans titoral amfortas and the crusaders or the holy knights in that case and i also love the costumes of Klingzor and Kundry. The thing about Parsifal's costume was that it was kind of a lot to be desired because I wasn't really so used to this type of production. Yes, I know, purists would definitely love to stay away from this production, but if you have an open mind, then just go check it out. Overall, this production is quite interesting. There are some times that it works and it resonates with me. Other times I kind of scratch my head. Though it kind of gets better later on in terms of the later acts, specifically act three. And now let's get on to the singing in which I am very excited to talk about. In the title role of Parsifal, we have German held in Tenor, Stefan Finke. Now, overall, I thought he was simply okay in this role. He has his moments in which he was able to sing Parsifal's realization with such, such finesse, with such a robust voice that it was just so magical. Yet in other moments, I almost didn't really care for his voice. There were times that it sounded quite nasal. And it sounded quite monotone, but when it came to that scene where Parsifal sang Amfortas die Wunder, I was just totally blown away. In fact, this is pretty much the only time I was able to actually appreciate Stefan Finke in this role. Now, as I understand, he's also sang a lot of... Wagnerian roles and has sang a lot of um, repertoire from the Helden tenor repertoire, basically. And I could really, I could really hear that at times his voice isn't always there. It's not always that crisp or clean. I could really hear that there are times that he does strain a bit, but when he sang that realization scene, I was just absolutely blown away. So overall, Mr. Finke was okay. The only highlight from him was definitely the realization part. I thought he was at his best. The other parts I thought were very iffy. And another thing I didn't really care for was that he almost looked too old to play someone as young as Parsifal. Usually I would expect someone who looks to be about 20 or excuse me 25 or 30 to be able to play or sing something like Parsifal. Here he looked as though that he was like in his 40s or 50s and I was kind of turned off by it. But still, despite those flaws, he still did a pretty good job with the highlight being Parsifal's realization, which is pretty much it. And then we have Kundry, sung by German dramatic soprano Evelyn Helitzios. Now, Evelyn Helitzios is a soprano I have heard a lot on YouTube, and I've heard a lot of clips from her, and her timbre is almost comparable to that of Gwyneth Jones. In fact, there are some things 
that she does share with the Welsh dramatic soprano, Madame Jones. First of all, it's the timbre of her voice. What she has in common with Madame Jones is that their voices are very well known for causing the paint of the ceiling to tear off. And at times they kind of have that wobble, which can be quite unhealthy to hear. Here as Kundry, I thought she was just absolutely fantastic. I thought her voice was pretty well controlled. And when she had to go insane, she went all out. I thought she looked absolutely gorgeous in that black gown. And I was just so taken away by just how beautiful she looked. And she was able to portray Kundry's histrionic nature very well. Her biggest highlight definitely has to be Grausame Fustu in Herz. I thought it was just powerfully sung with that ringing high B and Lachte. I thought it was just absolutely breathtaking. I was just totally taken aback at just how much power she had. Boy, I mean, this is a woman who has sung Ortrude, Zeglinda, Brunhilde, Venus, Elizabeth, Torandot, Leonora from Oberto. This is a woman who has sung a lot of big, dramatic, and Wagnerian soprano roles, and she did a fantastic job. I thought she was just excellent of how she was able to portray Kundry's madness and her chaotic nature at just how she's not so at peace with herself. I thought she was just fabulous. Boya Skolfus as Amfortas I thought was just wonderful. Now Mr. Skolfus is a baritone who is extremely well known for basically singing a lot of roles in the lyric baritone repertoire in the 80s and 90s and then somewhere in the 90s early 2000s and late 2000s, he has sung a lot more dramatic baritone roles. He basically started off as the Count Amaviva and Don Giovanni by Mozart, and alongside in the late 2000s, he has sung roles like Lear, and I think he's sung Posa. I'm not really too sure, but he's sung some big dramatic baritone roles, aside from his usual lyric baritone repertoire. I thought he was able to use the experience that he had singing the lyric baritone repertoire and the dramatic baritone repertoire to such finesse. I thought his voice was beautiful as Amfortas. It is so up there with Dietrich Fischer Dieskau and Eberhard Wächter and Bernd Weigel. Now, that's the, that's the thing about me as a person in terms of my tastes, in terms of this character of Amfortas, I personally prefer any Verdi baritone, any Cavalier baritone, any character baritone, and in some occasions a Wagnerian baritone, but I definitely prefer a Verdi baritone, or in most cases a dramatic baritone, to sing this challenging yet very sorrowful role. And I definitely got what I asked for with Mr. Skolfus as Amfortas. I thought he was another fantastic performer, the first one being Evelyn Helutius as Kondry. I thought he was just absolutely fantastic. Then we have Gornemann, sung by Hans-Peter König, who I saw about five months ago as Philip from Don Carlo. Now, I basically heard from my dear friends, Seth Carrico, who also sang a few roles at the Deutsche Oper, about how he felt about Hans-Peter König as Philip II. He felt that he was quite monotone, and he only had a big voice, and that's pretty much it. He's only serviceable in the German roles from Wagner and Strauss and Mozart. 
and here I thought he was in his element. Don't get me wrong, I actually like his Philip II. And I definitely felt that it was such a moving performance with such a round and rich and totally virile and dark basso voice. Here I thought he was in his element as Gournemans. He was able to play Gournemans' stern, yet very wise and caring nature very, very well. And he's also quite fatherly. But it's his voice that took me in so much. Like I said, it's a round and very cavernous instrument, which he uses very well, especially in the German operas. Now, I thought he was totally in his element as Gournemans, and he was absolutely fantastic. In the role of Titurel, we have Albert Pesendorfer, who I saw as Banco from Macbeth, and the Grand Inquisitor from Don Carlo. In this production, we do see Titurel in the flesh, which I have to say, even though Titurel is normally an offstage role, I'm actually pretty glad to see Titurel in the flesh because there's a lot more dynamic that Titurel has with his own son, Amfortes, and especially when he's in the flesh. And going to Albert Pesendorfer's performance as Titurel, I thought he was absolutely magnificent. He was able to have this type of chemistry with Mr. Skolfus as a Fortis. And I definitely believe that these two were father and son. And I could really feel Pesendorfer's presence as Titurel. It's as though that his Titurel is simply telling Amfortas, look boy, you're old enough to know what to do. I'm too old right now. I can't help you. You have to figure this out for yourself. I have to retire. I definitely felt his dignified, yet very old, um, for lack of a, better, of a better word, type of presence on stage. I definitely felt his presence on stage as minute and extremely thankless of a role like Titurel, I definitely really love his performance in such a dignified, yet very minute, basso profondo role. I thought he was just absolutely fantastic. And then we have Klingsor, sung by Bastian Efernik. Now, I am not really a huge fan of Efernik as Klingsor. When I think of Klingsor, I usually expect a voice and a presence that's far more menacing and far more threatening to the viewers. I usually expect someone like Hermann Ude, Gustav Neidlinger, Willard White, Falk Struckmann, Leif Rohr, Ekahad Vlasiha, and to some extent Walter Berry to sing this role. But Vlasi has not with us. Well, he's retired. And Willard White still has some engagements. Falk Struckmann has some engagements. And Leifor is obviously not with us. The same can be said for Neidlinga and the other bass baritones that I've mentioned. I usually expect a villainous sounding bass baritone voice and a voice that's a lot heftier, a lot meatier than the lyrical and a voice that was so full of pathos that we get in Amfortas. I'm usually expecting a more meatier, a more threatening type of voice. With Bastian Efrenik, I thought he was just, eh. Okay. I mean, his stage presence was quite menacing, but his voice was definitely small for such a commanding role, yet very, very thankless role like Klingzor. I thought his voice was too small to sing something like Klingzor. Granted, he started in singing some lyric baritone, lyric bass baritone, and he's slowly, slowly transitioning to the dramatic baritone repertoire. 
But having him as Klingsor, I thought was a bit of a letdown for me because for someone like me, I'm usually expecting a more heftier voice, a meatier voice, a more threatening voice, a voice that has sung roles like Alberich, Wotan, Ox, Waldner, or even Falstaff to some extent, or even that of Iago, or any of those villainous baritone, bass baritone, and in some occasions basso roles. I'm usually expecting a deeper voice. I'm expecting a more virile and sinuous voice, like someone like Eric Owens or um, Willard White, Fauch Trockmann, Ekehard Vlashiha, Gunther van Kahnen, Hartmut Velka, Zig Zygmunt Nimsgun. I could name a lot of fantastic bass baritones and helden baritones that come on the top of my head. Heck, even Bryn Terfel could have sung the role of Klingzor, but I think he's more of, a, of an enforcer. But only time can tell that our dear friend Bryn Terfel would probably one day sing Klingzor. Only time can tell. Hell, Bryn Terfel could have sung this role. As for Aphonic in Klingzor, I thought his voice was quite small. For such a demanding and very um, powerful and demanding role, a very commanding and very villainous role. He compensates for this in terms of his stage presence, which he doesn't ham up the evil factor, which I'll definitely give him points for. But as for his voice, I thought, mm, it's okay. It's not big, but it's just too small for my tastes. He was only okay. And then we have the two Grail Knights, sung by Burkhard Ulrich and Andrew Harris. I thought these two were absolutely fantastic. They have made great use of such minute roles with Andrew Harris's very sexy and very virile timbre to Burkhard Ulrich's character tenor timbre. I thought these two had such great dynamics with such minute roles and my friend Beata also told me that in five or ten years time Andrew Harris will definitely be singing a lot of bigger basso roles like Gornemans and Philip and even the Commendatore and I'm sure that day will definitely happen. As for Harris and Ulrich in these roles, I thought these two had such great dynamic. And then we have the four squires, sung by Shaban Stag, Christina Z Zidak, Paul Kaufman, and Alvaro Zambrano. I thought that these four were absolutely fantastic. Miss Stag and Miss Zidak, I thought were absolutely fantastic with both of their voices blending very well together with those of the light lyric tenor voices of Kaufman and my dear friend Alvaro Zambrano. I thought these four had such great dynamic. Then we have the Flower Maidens, also sung by Shaban Stag and Christina Zidak, but also joined by Martina Weschenbach, Katarina Bradic, Elena Tsalagova and Dana Beth Miller. I thought these six were absolutely fantastic. They had such great chemistry as these six deadly yet extremely beautiful and sexy yet kittenish flower maidens, or in some productions they're known as the magic maidens. I thought these six were absolutely fantastic and their voices blended very well in which I would probably call a chiara oscura. The lightness of the soprano voices combined with the sexy low notes of the mezzos and some of the fruity notes of some of the mezzos I thought were absolutely just harmonious. I was just totally wowed by their performance as the Flower Maidens. And then we have Dana Beth Miller in 
another small role, that of the heavenly voice. I thought she was able to make great use of such a very minute role. Especially in the first act, I really felt the presence of her voice, of just how commanding, yet very, very sinuous that type of voice was. I was just absolutely just enthralled by such a voice. So overall, there was a lot of great singing, some good singing overall. The special standouts definitely have to be Halitzius, König, Skolfhus, Peisendorfer, and the Six Flower Maidens, and especially Burkhard Ulrich, and my dear friend Andrew Harris. I thought they were absolutely fantastic, and the conducting was absolutely great as well. The same thing I can say about the choreography. Now, the choreography of this production definitely uses a lot of slow motion, which is pretty much an homage to a lot of the epic movies we have seen, whether we were growing up in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, whatever. Whether you've seen Ben-Hur or 300 or Star Wars, and you've seen those slow motions, or even the Matrix, those slow motion scenes definitely put definitely are a great use, and they pretty much make me feel like I'm also in some epic movie. So overall, even though there were a few setbacks here and there, especially with the production and at times the singing, I thought this was absolutely a fantastic evening for opera, especially since it's the Lenten season. Now, this is actually the second Lenten season-related opera that I've watched, the first being Cavalleria Rusticana, and now this, in terms of watching both of them in the Deutsche Oper Berlin. But still, if you haven't seen this opera yet, then I suggest you go check it out. There are still vacant dates available, so go check them out. But I strongly suggest that purists kind of stay away from this opera. If you're a purist, you might as well watch the 1980 Bayreuth film version on YouTube. But if you're open to any ideas, then knock yourself out. You will not be disappointed, especially when you have such great singing by Helitzius, Hans-Peter König, Albert Peisendorfer, Boschkovhus, and all of my friends, including Andrew Harris and Alvaro Zambrano. You will not be disappointed by having to hear such fantastic singing all throughout and equally hearing such fantastic conducting. Well, that's all for now. Tune in to my next review, which is going to be tomorrow, where I'll be reviewing two movies. The first one being A Long Way Down, which I'm quite excited to see. And the second one being Out of the Furnace. So definitely expect my review of A Long Way Down to be tomorrow somewhere in the late afternoon, and Out of the Furnace to be tomorrow evening. So definitely look out for those reviews. And also, stay tuned for April 18 and April 22, where I'll be reviewing some concerts in England, because I'll be in England during those days. And stay tuned for April 23 and April 27, where I'll be reviewing some concerts and operas and a few ballets in Amsterdam. So definitely look out for those. Until then, this is Antoni signing off, wishing you all a good night, and I hope you all have a wonderful weekend.